Joust, June 16th, 1982. Joust is fundamentally different from all the other games we've looked at so far, as it allows you to stay in the air for as long as you'd like, or at least as long as you can manage. Keeping control over the giant bird you ride on is easier said than done. You have to keep tapping the sole button to make your mount fly higher, but press it too frequently, and you can easily overshoot your target, bump against the ceiling, and bounce downward. The bird is also very inert when changing directions, and it often takes at least a few flaps to work against your previous momentum. The bird's stubbornness wouldn't be too much of a problem if flying around was all you had to do, but of course things aren't that peaceful. Other bird pilots try to take you out of the sky with their lances. You get the upper hand, quite literally, by bumping into them from a slightly higher position. But taking them out isn't enough. You also have to catch the eggs that drop after their defeat before new enemies hatch out of them. Later stages also house almost invincible pterodactyls that go after both you and your opponents. The stage layout doesn't change, but eventually the magma on the bottom starts cooking up, destroying the safe lower platforms. In recent days, Joust has been frequently referenced for providing the template for Nintendo's Balloon Fight. But it can hardly be overstated how innovative and engaging it is in its own right. It is, not without reason, the oldest game we included on our list of the 200 best games of all time. Jungle King, June 23rd, 1982. Taito's first contribution to the genre was so obviously inspired by Tarzan that it eventually had to have its title changed to something less referential, and the loincloth wearing Wild Man was transformed into a Dr. Livingstone Explorer type in shorts and a pith helmet. Like Jack the Giant Killer, the game is a collection of set pieces, but the gameplay is even more divergent between sections. At first, the hero has to traverse through the jungle by jumping from vine to vine with the right timing. Then follows a stage where he swims through a lake while avoiding or fighting alligators, swimming up to the surface every once in a while to catch a breath. After that, the journey continues up to a mountain, where the cannibals who kidnapped the white woman are rolling boulders at the hero from off screen. Finally, he needs to get past the aboriginal fiends by jumping over them in order to rescue his love. Jungle King is another early scrolling platformer, but to find the still developing standard for most of the 1980s, it always scrolls right to left. The game was ported to many home platforms, but the most impressive is the version for the supposedly outdated Atari VCS, which features parallax scrolling foreground elements. Taito also manufactured a variant called Pirate Pete, which is basically the same game with a new coat of paint. Donkey Kong Jr., June 30th, 1982. The first ever platformer sequel famously reverses the roles, and stars Mario as the villain, who, high on his victory from the first game, keeps Donkey Kong in a cage that's not an inch larger than the prisoner it holds, and subjugates him with a whip, which was wisely omitted from the American flyer for the game. So, Donkey Kong's son sets out to free his father. The little ape relies on a very different skill set than Mario, especially his jump, which has somewhat counterintuitive physical parameters. But the emphasis isn't so much on jumping anymore, as Donkey Kong Jr. mostly uses vines to get up the single screen stages. The third Donkey Kong game was more of a Galaga type shooting game, but one of the earliest Famicom or NES titles was the unusual iteration Donkey Kong Jr. Math, where two players get to race each other trying to create a correct calculation to the target value using the Donkey Kong Jr. mechanics of jumping and climbing on vines. While Donkey Kong's popularity saw a resurgence in the 1990s, thanks to Rare's Donkey Kong Country series, his offspring was pushed to the wayside in favor of Diddy Kong, who isn't even an ape. 
Donkey Kong Jr.'s last major appearance came in 1993 as a driver in Super Mario Kart. But that series quickly forgot him too once Wario came along. Poor Jr. To think, he even got his own brand of cereals back in the 80s. Springer, July 5th, 1982. Orca is a fascinating company from Japan's early arcade industry. They started out distributing bootleg versions of Donkey Kong and Miss Pac-Man, but eventually came around and started to create their own quirky games, like Springer. Among its innovations are moving and disappearing platforms, and the ability to drop to a lower level by pressing down, but not too far, or else the rabbit protagonist falls out of the clouds. No doubt the most impressive feature was the evolving enemies. They start out as eggs that simply can be picked up for points, until green lizards hatch out of them, who push the rabbit to his death if he doesn't kick them off first. Eventually, they turn red and grow wings, enabling them to leap from platform to platform. Comparatively subtle, but even more of a game changer, is the simulation of inertia. When jumping straight up on a moving platform, the rabbit keeps his velocity towards that direction in the air, and at a few points, he needs to jump from a rising platform and use the momentum in order to reach the higher areas. Springer is no masterpiece of game design, though. It has a lot of stages, but most of them are just kind of there, without any new challenges. There's no sense of progression, either, and the first area remains the hardest for at least a dozen stages. Pitfall, August 20th, 1982. Though it's hard to believe today, at the time of its inception, Activision was a wild young indie company of folks who had split from Atari with the desire to push the medium further, while actually receiving credit for their work. Founder David Crane's Pitfall was possibly the very first platforming game made specifically for a home console. Pitfall Harry's first adventure also introduced home audiences to the concept of stages that go beyond the limitations of the screen. Due to the technical limitations of the Atari VCS, the game has no scrolling. Instead, the screen flips to the next scene when the player crosses the border. The game is thematically very similar to Jungle King, but Pitfall Harry can't swim, so he needs to abuse alligators as platforms within the short window of time when they close their mouths. Some of the screens seem safe at first, but surprise with lakes and pits that open up suddenly to swallow the poor adventurer. Otherwise, Pitfall features several of the same elements, like swinging on vines to get past lakes and jumping over rolling obstacles. In this case, logs. The latter don't actually hurt the hero, but getting hit by them causes a small deduction from your score. The jungle has no end point, instead wrapping around to the beginning after 255 screens. You can even walk backwards right from the start, which makes the expedition easier in a few ways. A peculiar feature of Pitfall is the vertical division of the screen into two layers. You can climb down ladders and avoid many of the hazards, but the caves are populated by deadly scorpions. Sometimes, brick walls force you to backtrack and continue above ground. Figuring out the fastest way through is essential in order to find all 20 treasures within the time limit. As is so often the case with Atari VCS games, doing so just stops the game unceremoniously. But even without a proper ending, Pitfall pushed boundaries on the Atari console and became a major hit for Activision with more than 4 million copies sold. It was ported to many other platforms, and that won't be the last we see of Pitfall Harry, either. That's it for this installment. If you enjoy our videos and want to help us make more, please consider supporting us through Patreon.